Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. On the second Wednesday of each month, and often in between, we discuss the latest bioscience publications. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read more, point your browser to academic.oup.com forward slash bioscience. Today's episode is a little bit different from our normal fare. Its purpose is to share with you an audio recording of a viewpoint that's just appeared in bioscience. The article is entitled, A Call to Action, Marshalling Science for Society, and it was written by the past presidents of AIBS, whose help we've enlisted in reading it as well. But before we go to that audio recording, I thought it'd be nice to introduce it with a quick chat with AIBS's president, Dr. Charles Fenster, who's director of the Oak Lake Field Station affiliated with South Dakota State University in Brookings, South Dakota. And a quick side note, if you'd like to enter the contest that we discussed toward the end of our chat, send your guest to bioscience at AIBS.org. I'll repeat it, bioscience at AIBS.org with the subject heading bird contest, which I promise will make sense in a moment. But let's go to that chat. Dr. Fenster, thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so we're here to talk about this past president's viewpoint that has just come out today at the time that we'll be publishing this release. And I guess the first question is, you know, how did the idea for this viewpoint uh, come about? Uh, well, it was recognized by the staff and board that the past presidents represent a tremendous wealth of knowledge, institutional knowledge, uh, as, as, as well as uh, knowledge of how to proceed in the present challenges that are uh, facing uh, the United States um, and uh, the scientific community. How did you go about the first steps of convening this group? You know, what went into that process? Well, it, it was really quite easy. We contacted uh, the uh, living past presidents, and uh, by and large, all all the past presidents were very willing uh, to have their voices heard or participate in a conversation of 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 how to best meet the challenges that we face today. And, you know, I think it's probably worth noting that this effort is not, you know, something that's happened in isolation. This is building on a history of similar work done at AIBS and, and done, in fact, by many of these past presidents, uh, you know, when they were in the leadership positions at AIBS. Can you tell us a little bit about how this is kind of part of that legacy? Um, this certainly isn't a one-off. Exactly. So one of the fascinating aspects of uh, listening to the past president. So our, our first step was to convene a, uh, a Zoom chat call, uh, but it was striking that many of the challenges that I'm aware of regarding the organization uh, or the challenges that the organization is, is trying to meet um, and address for the broader community uh, are, are, are consistent ac across the 10 years of the different presidents. And uh, so whether it's the um, internal challenges within AIBS of, of how to better serve uh, our uh, member organizations um, and societies, uh, but also how, to, how AIBS can be a platform for informing uh, policymakers. Uh, and so, uh, so, for example, Gene Likens uh, played a, a his group played a, a huge role uh, in uh, 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 modification of clean air standards uh, to address the issue of acidification of, of uh, our waters. Um, and um, not dissimilar to the sorts of um, policy questions that we face today uh, with COVID-19, of course, we have, um, these are, uh, of, of greater um, immediate concern to the U.S. public today. Yeah, and I would recommend that everyone who can go back and listen to the In Their Own Words interview that I did with Gene Likens or read it in Bioscience. Um, he kind of goes into some of the descriptions of how that policy was originally formed, and I think the lessons still bear repeating today. Um, but let's chat for a moment about the fact that this is not a one-off venture. This is not you know a single viewpoint article that we're going to publish and then forget about. Uh, we have some next steps planned, so uh, let's talk a little bit about those. Yes, ab absolutely. Uh, the um, past presidents each have their own in individual expertises, uh, whether it has to do with uh, undergraduate education or uh, with addressing, or I should say articulating uh, issues for our uh, member societies and organizations to funding agencies and so forth. 
And so I would encourage everyone to stay tuned because there is more to come from that group that'll be on this podcast and also items in bioscience, editorials and viewpoints and the like. Uh, so keep an eye out. But before we get into the sharing of the viewpoint itself, uh, we wanted to kick things off on a little bit of a lighter note, which is that if you listen carefully, you may hear in the background a bird. And we are going to offer an award for the first person who is able to correctly identify the species. But Charlie, I will let you describe the contest that we have in mind. Yes, ab absolutely. So indicative of the times we live in with children in the background or, or pets uh, asking for attention, uh, there is a bird screeching in uh, the reading of, of the viewpoint. And um, if somebody can identify the species of bird, uh, we will donate uh, $100 in your name uh, to the Emerging Public uh, Policy Leadership um, Awards Program. Yep, and that award goes to um, you know graduate students who've been identified as those who have you know particular initiative and leadership in science policy, uh, and that's an important award that AIBS gives out every year. And I'll also include a link to the show notes for those who'd like to learn more about that. Uh, but at this point, with no further ado, uh, let's go to the reading of the viewpoint. As the current and past presidents of the American Institute of Biological Sciences we find the assault by politicians and special interest groups on the use of scientific knowledge to guide public policy decision-making alarming and dangerous. The marginalization of scientific information in decision-making has significant negative effects on our public health and safety, our environmental sustainability, and our general well-being. We need not look further than the disruption and deaths that have resulted in many countries including the United States, from failing to use scientific evidence in making decisions on how to control the COVID-19 pandemic. AIBS has long stood for the use of science to promote informed decision-making based on the best available evidence. We have helped secure new resources for science and education, defeated anti-science initiatives, and promoted integrity in the use of scientific information to make research funding decisions. Despite these and similar efforts, many politicians in the United States and around the world have continued to spread misinformation to promote goals they consider desirable. In the face of this problem, we are obligated to repeat that all policy should, should be, be based, based on, on sound science, science and its application to dealing with any policy of consequence, including those that address the existential threats to civilization. Science does not tell us what specific steps to take to address a particular issue, but it provides information with a measured degree of certainty that should be taken into account when reaching a decision. Unfortunately, debates are often linked to self-interest and public pronouncements by the parties involved often provide little guidance for distinguishing between alternative positions because only a subset of information is presented in the argument. Because, because policy, policy choices, choices often revolve around the issue of causation, sound policy cannot be constructed by suppressing available evidence. Policymakers need to understand how science can be used to resolve problems. The scientific process consists of constructing and testing hypotheses. Hypotheses are plausible explanations based on available information obtained by gathering and analyzing appropriate data. This information is itself subject to strong internal checks via, often, anonymous review by specialists before, before it is deemed, it deemed reliable. reliable. Even then, only after independent verification of the data and after independent methods of investigation have corroborated the conclusions does the science community accept the hypothesis. However, science does not specify any particular action. The International Panel on Climate Change, for example, does not mandate actions but evaluates the likelihood of different outcomes from different actions. Virtually all scientists agree that climate change is a reality, but that agreement does not dictate specific action. Instead, 
the conclusions should be employed rationally in decisions based on the likelihood that climate change is occurring. For example, a, a generation, generation ago, ago, there were debates about acid precipitation contributing to the decline of our pristine lakes. A group of scientists used a variety of approaches, including sophisticated chemical techniques, to trace precipitation in the Northeast back to coal and oil-fired power plants in the Midwest, thereby demonstrating its source with a high degree of certainty. Eventually, the explanation of damage from acid precipitation was accepted and led to the passage of the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, which resulted in a reduction in environmental damage through the reduced emissions of sulfur and nitrogen oxides. At present, we are confronting a global, global disaster, the COVID-19 pandemic, which is being countered in part by steps based on the evidence produced by epidemiologists, virologists, and researchers in many other fields, which has guided the heroic efforts of medical care professionals worldwide. Unfortunately, those who want the public to believe that there is no problem have slowed our response and limited its effectiveness. Achieving herd immunity, a strategy that requires widespread infections to occur, has surfaced among the membership of President Trump's White House Coronavirus Task Force. Most experts in the field disagree with this approach, but there has been no real effort by policymakers to evaluate the evidence and to take the most effective steps possible. Instead, their arguments have been based on achieving specific theoretical outcomes and have largely ignored the source of the problem, spread, spread through, through person, person to person, person contact. contact. Consequently, the public has been led to believe that a suggestion is either right or wrong, and that they should choose between alternative views on the base of advice from whomever they trust at the time, rather than on the developing information that is being made available. AIBS mission is to promote the use of scientific information to inform decision-making at the nexus of life science and society, a mission that is arguably more vital now than it has ever been in the past. For our society to survive in the complex modern world, we must all unite to promote the best, best science, science possible. possible. Use it to meet the challenges we face and implore policymakers to listen to and act on the best information that scientists provide. This course of action will enable us to limit the spread of COVID-19, the disastrous disruption of the world's climate, the poisoning of global land and air and water, and the extinction of a major portion of the biodiversity on which we ultimately depend for our survival. The progress of science over the centuries has led to our deep understanding of natural phenomena we must find ways to benefit from that understanding as we move into the future. Let us join together to insist on acting logically and rationally in a world so plagued by self-centered and short-term goals and the false information they all too often generate.